welcome to Beating a Dead Horse, where we tell you who lived, who died, and who deserved to die. I'm your host, Sean McKenda. And I'm your host, Jackson Keller. And this week, we watch Atomic Blonde. If you ever wanted a female-led action movie that's part Jason Bourne, part James Bond, and about 80 times the plot holes, this movie is for you. Pretty accurate summary, although to be fair... I would assume something like Moonraker, like the one where James Bond like goes to the moon, might have a few more plot holes than this, but this is hey, this hey, is hey, a hey, tangled hey, hey. web. Moonraker is the most scientifically accurate James Bond movie to date. I say this having never seen it, only knowing that it is physically possible to put a rake on the moon, and I assume that is oh, the you. extent of the plot. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, let's talk about fucking Atomic Blonde. Yeah, yeah. It, it definitely has its, it, as you were saying, it definitely has its tangled web. It is kind of a mess, especially towards the end, but it's a good mess. Like, I'm not going to lie. It was an enjoyable movie, and I had a good time watching it. If you like the James Bond movies, if you like the Jason Bourne movies, you're gonna like this one. It's it's enjoyable. There's no getting around that. It's schlocky. It's kind of B spy movie, but it's very stylish. It's very crisp. It's very well done visually. Yeah, I would describe it as at least for the first half because there's some shifts in sort of how the movie operates, um, in terms of. How much it's focused on action, how much it's focused on intrigue. It's not, if you're going and expecting something like Mad Max or Baby Driver that's just nonstop, like propulsion from start to finish. I mean, I couldn't blame you if you were. I was expecting that just from the way it was advertised. Yeah, before I had uh, seen it, I saw like one review that had mentioned, I think specifically it had said if you were expecting John Wick, which I haven't seen, but I'm assuming is kind of like that, uh, to temper your expectations a little bit in terms of the action. But I was uh, speaking as someone who is a fan of spy thrillers and all all those good good tropes. Uh, I love me, love me some Cold War espionage. Uh, this was a great time actually doing some interesting stuff because the first half of the movie just kind of feels like a really sleazy hitchcock movie to me there's a lot of uh kind of kind of old school in some ways there's a lot of focus on this MacGuffin of like all this data from like the spy networks and everyone's trying running around and trying to get it they talk about having it on like the like i think they even say microfilm at one point but uh yeah, so it's the first half of the movie is not quite as action packed as you'd expect, but of course, uh, without diving too much into spoilers, it ramps up in a very, very satisfying way, I would say, before uh, it maybe gets a little too tangled in itself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just kind of speaking off my one real gripe with this movie, other than the fact that it does get kind of tangled with itself, and I think this assists in it tangling into itself is for me it felt like i was watching a movie that was a composite of six different directors kind of all putting their vision together um i know jackson you didn't feel quite as strongly about that as i did but uh, something about it just from scene to scene it would feel very different and I, I can't exactly put my finger on what would have changed so much between these scenes, but sometimes it would just be a change in the way the music is handled, or we'd go from a very action-y scene with a certain camera style to one where that same camera style was conspicuously absent, and it felt like more than just a scene change, it felt like there was just some sort of style change between the scenes that I it's, it's hard to put my finger exactly on it but I feel like the style change basically without once again getting into spoilers don't worry we'll still give you our warning and everything we start to lose the plot and some of the character motivations later on which I feel like the fact that we see so many styles throughout this movie 
intentionally, no matter how you want to look at it, like there is some definitive style changes from scene to scene. The constant flux really kind of creates some, I guess, cognitive dissonance is a good way of putting it, where you're not entirely sure what is happening. And I could see that in and of itself being a style choice, given that, as you said, it was supposed to be kind of a grimy feeling movie, but it left me just confused at the end. Yeah, I definitely, as you said, didn't feel quite as strongly. I definitely did pick up on the shifts, um, but maybe just wasn't quite bothered so much by it. I felt that for a little while it was fairly consistent tonally and stylistically. It was using a lot of the, like... 80s German, like, pop, like, really leaning into that 80s, end of the Cold War setting, uh... Which, let me tell you, I ate that fucking 80s German synth pop up. That is entirely (laughs) my jam. Get me some Depeche Mode any day. I'm fucking It was really great. I I really enjoyed the soundtrack of this movie, and I liked how liberal, uh, they used it. Kind of, kind of, not really. Like, Baby Driver was using music in a bit of a different way um and but speaking of baby driver uh i think you're on to something because with this movie you i feel like with baby driver you could take an individual scene from that and no matter what scene it is if you've seen baby driver or like even if you just know what the premise is you would recognize it from, like, how cohesive Edgar Wright's style is in that movie. Whereas with this one, you definitely can't say quite the same thing. Uh, you get, like, Suicide Squad-esque, like, splash, like, spray paint, like, title cards. Then some scenes of really, like, down and dirty, like, brutal, low-key fighting. And then a scene of, uh, Charlize Theron using a man's neck to swing on a rope like George of the Jungle. (laughs) Uh, And it's... It didn't... I I thought some of those shifts were interesting. Some... It didn't confuse me quite as much, mostly because... And we're starting to get a little bit into plot spoilers, so without saying too much about that, I think that... I had sort of accepted early on that the movie is going to want to leave me in a bit of a state, not being entirely sure of what everyone's game is. And I was sort of able to go along with that. But, so kind of the expectation was that in the end, everything would come together and pay off and make sense in hindsight. As, as as happens as as does happen in a lot of these like spy thrillers, or at least but, leave you with that good lingering question in the back of your mind. Yeah, yeah. Whereas like this takes like a hard left at the very end. Like maybe maybe even just like the last five minutes. I think like if you cut out the last five minutes, it would be more cohesive. But that's that's again getting into spoilers into more specific details. Uh, but. In general, just kind of, just to kind of summarize, uh, it was schlocky, it was lurid, it was gross. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah, no, I left the theater very much enjoying it, just very confused in a lot of areas. Um, but let's slide into spoilers. We'll come back to that um, confusion about plot because it ties into a lot of deaths and why we think they happened but we're not entirely sure and we'll probably spend like 40 minutes just trying to unravel some motivations but before we do that let's kind of just discuss theme shifts and how they pertain to the way deaths were presented from the beginning to the middle to the end since this was more of a problem that you noticed what was what sort of can you think of the moment in the movie where you started to lose track with it a little bit in what regard like the the the, sty- the stylistic stuff, um, the way the camera work and everything is handled because I th- I thought it was fairly consistent until a certain point. Like it didn't bother me. Uh, 
in it's... terms of like how this film was shot. So the part that the shooting of it kind of all put me on edge because I thought like the opening scene with her getting out of the bath um, in a very like tasteful manner was absolutely incredible. Her looking at just her destroyed body was very good. The part that really jarred me for the first time was when we got the spray paint as the like title crawl. And so that is kind of the first part that it really pulled me out of how I was expecting the movie to go because it had a weird contrast on the kind of doured down grayscale styled setting with this bright splash of color that we never really see again. And it feels like something where we have that kind of contradictory shots throughout the movie. Um, Like, this is an R-rated movie. It's very clearly deemed as such. And the first person we see get killed, we see get killed with literally no blood. Which... I was expecting there to be like a stylistic choice behind that or for there to be a reason or anything like that, but there it just it never ended up paying off. There was nothing to it. And as a matter of fact, we see very, very little blood throughout the movie except for in like two scenes, which believe me we're gonna be talking about, but for this first scene, which is a big, you know, fuck you, you're dead type of scene, it was weird to just not get even, like, there was no blood. Like, I'm not exaggerating when I say there was nothing. He gets shot in the head, there's not blood on the back of his head, we get a glimpse of that, we get a glimpse of the ground, there is there is literally nothing. And I could never come up with a cohesive reason for that to exist in such a way. So it's conflicts in style and expectations and how it's shot that really kind of throws me for a loop. You know, until you just mentioned it, I actually forgot that we open on the scene of that guy getting shot in the head. Mm -hmm. Uh, Which is bonkers because... That guy getting shot in the head is what drives the central MacGuffin of, you know, people going after the list. Like, the Russians have the list of all the spies. And that's why we we need to go get it back. That's why the whole plot is happening. But I think it really speaks to the confused nature of the movie in that after a while, you just kind of forget about that other, that agent that got shot at the beginning. Especially because he's explicitly stated to have a relationship with Charlize Theron's character. Like, there's some heavy implications of it in the beginning, and then he just fades out into nothing. And it... There's... I I just... I don't understand the opening shot. It kind of introduces this ghost of a main antagonist who ends up being like a total non-character bit <laughs> gets part. killed very unceremoniously <laughs> yeah and pretty bloodless with that as well like that's the part that i just i don't understand the first time and i like i was watching this with a friend and we both kind of noticed that there wasn't any blood and we were watching the theater and we're like there was nothing there the first time we saw any sort of blood, and it was a very small amount, was when uh, Charlize bashes a dude's head against a taxi window. And the glass shatters, and there's a small splotch of blood. And then she throws him out of a car, and there's no blood. There's just just nowhere. And I, I seriously, it, I'm not asking for a gory horrific movie as last week we talked about dunkirk and how there was very little viscera to it 
But there was a point to that. In this movie, it's an R-rated movie. They're allowed to go nuts. They can Kingsman this shit and have people just <laughs> sliced in half and watch them fall apart and shit. And there's not blood on the first shot that kills the instigating factor. Yeah. For- you know, I hadn't I hadn't thought about Kingsman that much, but it's... It's maybe worth bringing up in comparison because I feel like Kingsman is kind of the best. Like Kingsman fucking rules. <laughs> it's kind of the best. It's kind of the best spy movie we've had in recent memory for a lot of reasons. And that initial shock of the blood in that movie, because like that that movie opens with, uh, like, it does that that movie either opens. It's either the scene in a rock where like someone jumps in the grenade. It's either that or. If it's not at the very beginning, shortly after that, we get a scene of a dude getting, like, bisected, like, down the middle. And that really lets you know, like, oh, man, like, I, you're in for a ride. I remember watching this with you in the theater, and I knew it was an R-rated movie going into it. I was very excited for this. I thought it looked like an incredible movie. And I remember, because the dude does jump on the grenade before that scene, but you never get anything out of it. It still looks like it could pass as a PG-13 spy movie, very James Bond. And then the dude gets bisected. And this is in the first five minutes, so don't worry. We're not really spoiling anything for you. Yeah. Um, And you and our roommate at the time both looked at me like, (laughs) what the fuck did you just take us to? This is not what we signed up for. Yeah, I, I had actually forgotten that movie was rated R. Which with this movie, I, I guess you're right. I hadn't thought about my reaction that much in these terms. Because with this movie, I didn't. I didn't forget that I was seeing an R-rated movie. And it also struck me as kind of weird that it was so bloodless. And even weirder because Kingsman... I don't want to call Kingsman a cartoon. But it's definitely a lot more in the vein of like your Roger Moore era James Bond. It's like a, a lot caricature. Campier. Yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely it's pay it's it's a loving homage to kind of the '60s spy movies and a lot of the ridiculousness of that. But this movie, especially because I think otherwise it does such a good job establishing the setting of like East Berlin and West Berlin and kind of this underground oppressed scene is like the communists try and like re- regain controls because you know you see the shots of this more important historical thing with the wall with the berlin wall coming down and how that's progressing in the background and kind of setting the stage and like otherwise we're mostly seeing like kind of the seedy underbelly of the city and that's really um to the point where i can even imagine people uh calling it gratuitous but so it's strange that in the we have that hard contrast between a lot of like the neon lights, the pop mu- the it the starts synth pop before that even. I just remembered there's that whole kind of opening gag about the Berlin Wall falling, and then this is not that story. That's a that's a very strange gag because that. That almost makes you expect something more like a Kingsman. Especially with the way the advertising is treating this movie as, like, Kingsman is probably the best description of what I was expecting. I was expecting a female-led Kingsman murder romp with spy elements to it, and I was so on board with this. And the opening really presented it as such, and it is... Not that at all. It is much more in line with a James Bond or Jason Bourne movie. Yeah. And, like, this is... This is where my whole confusion about this movie is. Why it feels like there was six different directors all trying to do their own thing with it. Because that is so out of place for the rest of this movie. There might be a single other joke in the movie there is none it's just it's a serious movie and it's so out of place especially because the way the dude gets killed in a kind of funny way too because he makes a remark about you're the one guy or ah what is it some along the lines of like if i was going to be killed I wanted to be killed by Russia's best or something like that. Yeah, not some shit person like you. Yeah. It, it... It's very quippy. Yeah, Hmm. and then it never comes back. And 
there's just scenes that kind of transition in a very similar way where we get the neon and then we don't. And it's not even, it doesn't even feel like we're going from neon and thematically west to east. There are times when we remain in the west and we go from the neon to the shitty and it just, and there's an argument to be made that it's the encroachment of the east, uh, the east destitution on the west but we're never really given an example of east destitution we see that they're broke which is actually the definition of destitute and i'm using it totally incorrectly but i'm gonna lean into it (laughs) um and we never get a an evil side from the west so anytime there's neon and then there's not it's it doesn't there's i i can't find a theme, and I am digging for it. I want there to be something that I can grasp onto so that this movie suddenly makes sense, because I want this movie to make sense. It was a good movie. It just... It it was a good movie, but maybe not a good script. I I think there's a difference between the two. I think you can still be an enjoyable work of cinema like you can still enjoy the action and there very much is enjoyable action in this like like i said earlier charlie's there and george of the jungles off of a dude's neck it's great um and that's not even the best action scene by by fucking far uh so i think it can still be fun and kind of schlocky and you can enjoy and i can actually see like this movie being kind of off-putting to a lot of people uh just between like, I very much enjoyed uh, James McAvoy's performance as kind of this, like, grimy, sleazy, uh, I think they call him, like, gone native. In, yeah. Uh, as, like, you know, kind of kind of nuts uh, spy man. It, it's kind of fun, but I can see someone just, like, looking looking at his character and being like, ugh, like, gross. And the whole, like, kind of, ex- and kind of, like, grindhouse, like, Ex- exploitive like male gaze like presentation of the sex scene between uh Lorraine and Charlie Theron's character and the uh French agent See, um that's weird though too is because that's given a very you're right it's a very male gaze in that situation but the opening scene of her getting out of the bathtub is very spy movie and she's presented in a very masculine presentation one of power because as she's getting out you see uh breasts and you see nipple but you see it in the same way that you would see uh daniel craig getting out of the bathtub where it's just a feature on them and it focuses much more on the fact that she is fucking ripped like her back muscles are insane and like that entire time it's focused much more on the back and butt which is a very male spy movie i mean i guarantee we've seen daniel craig's ass in well, <laughs> one of the james bonds da- daniel craig I, I think it's casino royale where he's like rising out of the ocean and it like shows off like his rippling muscles there's a particular like shot that I, I can think of in my head i just can't remember which movie it's from uh but yeah no you're, you're totally right in the way that those scenes differ uh one is very much treated as kind of a serious like noir like that scene wouldn't feel out of place in like blade runner or something yeah Uh, just kind of the way it's lit and the way it's treated um versus the really grindhouse like club gross like completely i mean i guess like in the spirit of james bond like gratuitous sex scene uh I think that is kind of what they were going for, and um, oh, to- oh, it totally is. But I- I'm just saying, I can see that being like off-putting to a lot of people. If you're gonna enjoy Atomic Blonde, you gotta you gotta accept a certain amount of sleaze. To, you gotta have a little bit of sleaze in your heart. To vouch for a feminine perspective, though, I do see this with my friend who is a girl. She was actually pretty pleased with the way that scene paid out, just because it was a positive portrayal of a lesbian scene in a movie where she was expecting Charlize to bang James McAvoy. Um, so it w- she was happy that, if nothing else, it wasn't just a man falls in love with woman or male spy bangs woman spy. So there is some something to be said for at least a positive representation to some degree. But I, I, 
it's it's really hard to say and i think it the how you want to view that scene is going to differ from person to person especially because there's an argument to be said that it's very sexually charged and whatnot but it doesn't like the amount of actual nudity you see feels more incidental i don't know i was getting kind of a oh man it's two girls isn't this hot kind of kind of vibe from the camera in that scene it is kind of perspective based and depending on who you're watching it with and what your thought process is at the time yeah that's that's kind of neither here nor there as far as uh death goes yeah i I do (laughs) it's kind of the exact opposite (laughs) ha ha uh no but uh i do think it's just relevant in terms of kind of the wonky tone in that a lot of the deaths feel they differ for sure yeah in terms of in terms of how they're presented from one scene to the next like you get kind of that quippy opening uh and then later on during the the best action scene which feels very much uh i was thinking like the casino royale like parkour scene but it's a lot more it's a lot more brutal and stripped down than that. It Just is the whole s- visceral. Yeah, it's it's real good. Uh, the whole sequence starting when she's trying to protect Spyglass, like get Spyglass across the border because he has the list. Uh, and- Quick context, just in case you are watching this and you or are listening to this and you haven't seen the movie. The list is the MacGuffin. Spyglass has memorized the list. He is just some dude that memorized the list to try and get from the east side to the west side of Germany to escape. You're caught up. Yep, there you go. I mean, you know, as far as that's the clearest... The MacGuffin is, like, the clearest thing about the mo- motivation of this movie. Like, people want the MacGuffin. We understand that much. Uh, which is good, because we don't understand much else. So, um, but as soon as that sequence starts, like, we get, uh, again... And this is this is where, because uh, I had seen you... Before I would seen this movie, I had seen you tweet about it. And so I was kind of a little bit on the lookout for kind of these shifts. And that was the moment where I thought the shift was actually working kind of an interesting way uh, that I enjoyed. It felt like a after kind of a bloodless first act, it felt like a really satisfying payoff to me. Like to just go through and see this brutal slugfest of people getting fucking domed and this burst of glorious blood and people just like hitting each other in the face with whatever they could get their hands on uh, yeah like, it's like, just, it's a fucking beautiful fight scene it's incredibly well choreographed you watch people just go from like she's running through this uh apartment complex it seems trying yeah. to protect spyglass and just getting the shit kicked out of her while she's kicking the shit out of everyone there is this is like the only time in the movie where there is literally no music it is just grunts and wet smacks as you hear knuckle on face and i mean yeah it's it is visceral and rough it's it's no music and i don't know if it's all one take but it's certainly a lot of long takes, like a lot of back and forth, not a lot of quick jump cuts, not like the... I, I saw it with with my friend who commented that she really liked how it wasn't, like, taken where they'll use, like, eight jump cuts to show Liam Neeson, like, jumping over a fence. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's true, and that really... Uh, a, a wonder uh, used properly... Um, can really add a lot to a scene to make it uh make it flow make all those give it kind of that naturalistic feel make everything kind of hit home it kind of reminds me of uh and this is not like a spy movie but i like that scene sort of reminded me of the finale of children of men which is kind of a famous like long take uh like war war zone scene and i mean i didn't think i'd be making that comparison to a, about a movie called Atomic Blonde, uh, but it's here and it works really well. And honestly, I would say like even if you're not down uh, with kind of the grimy like '80s like vibe, like if if you're a fan of like action cinema at all, like it's an impressive piece of fucking work. Uh, like almost, 
almost as memorable to me as like the Kingsman church scene, but like in a different way. Yeah, I mean, it's it sticks with you, and they're very they're very different scenes. But the Kingsman church scene and this one are are a very apt comparison because they both do stick with you because they are just murder slug fests. But the Kingsman one is very pumped up and you're really feeling it and you're really in on it and this one is much more of a you're really feeling it but you're really reservedly feeling it you're kind of like if you're like me a little uncomfortable while you're watching it because you are suddenly very aware that there is no music and you are just watching people get the living shit kicked out of them and feeling it and just watching them slow down there was I don't know that I've ever even seen a movie before where I've watched a fight scene actually slow down as people are struggling to catch their breaths to survive. <laughs> I, I have. It's it, it is ridiculously enough, it's actually the shirtless fist fight at the end of Metal Gear Solid 4. <laughs> and I was actually thinking about that towards the end. Uh, but... Uh, no, that is one of the things that makes it really great. And in comparison to the Kingsman uh, scene, also also a bunch of long takes. I think that one's also a one-er. Uh, but the Kingsman scene feels like a video game almost. It's almost like the trailers for like... Like the pre-rendered trailers for an Assassin's Creed game where, where Colin Firth is like diving around and like stabbing people with this stuff and taking on like three dudes at once and just mm. looking real fucking fly while doing it. Whereas this is just... Uh, punishment i was cringing so much during this this fight like and it worked like, just so well for it Ooh, ooh, that hurt oh god look at their faces oh no they're getting back up stay down <laughs> it was kind of interesting too with this fight scene is because it it actually i like this because it presented death it, it it's one of those times where i'm really I get really excited, apparently, about understated death. This is something that I've learned about myself in the episodes that we've done. Because <laughs> you watch her kind of kill people, but it's it's never celebrated or embraced in this scene. It's very much a quick relief, and you kind of feel that relief of tension as you're like all right that's one down all right that's one down but it's always like bang it's down pan to the next guy it's never a pan yeah we did it or like pan glory shot it's just move on it's not over we gotta keep moving and it it keeps the tension up it keeps everything moving and pumping I like it a lot, and as I said, it comes from the fact that the way she kills people in this scene is so... The build-up to the death is long and rough. The deaths themselves are not the focus, but kind of work as a sense of relief. Yeah, I think that's a good summary of why that scene works so well. Unfortunately, that scene also kind of gets into after not the setup of it and then the aftermath of it where things start to go a little bit wrong because the setup of this scene is that uh maybe the other important plot element that we're neglecting to mention kind of what i would say is the movie's central tension uh if is that in addition to getting this list kind of this macguffin uh lorraine has another uh, Charlize Theron's character has another task, and that is to find a traitor, like a double agent who's working for the Russians, and assassinate them. And of course, since he's such like a scumbag, it's heavily implied to be uh, Percival, James McAvoy's character. And But since Lorraine herself is such like a professional, like stone-cold killer... And you you kind of get the sense, and, and if, if you've got, like, a bit of genre savviness about this kind of, like, double agent, like, spy movie stuff, you kind of get the sense that it's her. And, and the movie kind of leaves you wondering, like, all right, is it, it's kind of building up to be McAvoy, but I'm not so sure. It plays uh, between the two of them 
quite a bit where you'll go from scene to scene where you're like, all right, it's definitively this person. And then the next scene, it'll kind of throw something else at you and be like, maybe I was wrong. And, and I think as far as motivations go, I think when that stuff is working pretty well, like I was feeling that throughout the movie and tracking with it pretty well. But when we come to the conclusion, the conclusion of it all really throws things into question because the setup of the apartment complex fight is the apartment complex sequence is that uh the spyglass character is shot and mm-hmm. he's shot because james mcavoy tipped off the tipped off the russians well no james and... mcavoy shoots him oh, oh james mcavoy does shoot him but uh but but like the, the plan was like you know he it, it, he's showing that he's working with the russians because he was gonna have him taken out by snipers and then they had the umbrella silliness and that, uh, you know, threw a wrench into things. Uh, so point is that this, this is kind of our moment where we're like, okay, like McAvoy is Satchel. McAvoy's our traitor. Uh, and then Spyglass dies, uh, in a way that is a little, is a little strange to me, but maybe just because by the end of the movie, like I can't, track with what Lorraine's deal is. <laughs> J- I have if, if you know what no I mean. No idea. I lo- lost track of who was doing what so long ago. It gets ridiculous. And the problem is, is that then people start dying and you have no idea why. And I still don't know why like four people died so I, let's let's do this i'm gonna propose this yeah uh let's go through just from the end of that sequence to like the end of the movie okay and explain who dies and then try and like wrap our heads around it all right all right i'm totally down with this let's 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 do this spyglass dies and that so Lorraine, Lorraine knows that it's Percival is, is like the one who set set them up. Well, like she knows that. Okay, the question is, does she? Because she does. okay, she does. so she saw him shoot him, or because she uh, didn't seem to know that he got shot until after he got shot, and she didn't see, and she looked up, not at Percival at that point. But I think I think she knew, she knew that Percival was planning this, but she didn't expect percival himself to do the job okay if, 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 if you follow what i'm saying yeah i got so you. Uh, he, she she definitely knew that this was a setup uh or or maybe not at the beginning of the scene but you know by the end of that scene she very much knows yeah so um she, and then earlier in the movie we get like some silly sound playing with the soundtrack playing with sound uh because her french agent's who is, by the way, like, I know this is the point of her character, but is just the most incompetent fool, like, <laughs> I've ever seen in a spy movie. Um, and the French agent tells her something about Percival, and, you know, we as the audience don't hear it. Uh, and we never hear it, which is kind of irritating to me, but it's neither I think, here nor there. I think that decision to make us never hear it could have worked better if the movie had a little more, like, purposeful, solid ambiguity. Whereas, like, here, it gives us answers, but the answers don't make any sense. Uh, The answers suck. The the answer is strange. So then she knows about Percival's plan, so she goes to take him on, have her little showdown, and he's gone. He's peaced out. Uh, Because the stupid French agent... (laughs) calls percival and basically says neener neener i know what you're doing uh and then percival puts on a silly looking like gimp mask and goes over to like try and like like strangle her and it's kind of this like long like played out sequence that i just don't know why a like i know the french lady is supposed to be like new to this whole like spy business but is she really that dumb? Is she that dumb to just, like, inform this man who she clearly knows and thinks is dangerous that, like, ha-ha, I've won? Uh, because then it happens exactly like you'd expect 
he comes over and takes her out. Uh, and then Lorraine... Does Lorraine show up at his house and then he's also there? P- point... Or no, 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 yeah. So then she goes back and finds that uh, the French girl is dead. Then she goes and hunts down Percival. And then she shoots him and that seems to be the moment. It's not explicitly said, but like Percival, as he's kind of dying... Uh, or is on the ground, he's like, oh, like, you've been bad, like, I've seen the list, like, I know it was you, uh, and then you kind of get the sense of, like, all right, uh, he still could have been Satchel, like, he still could have been lying until the very end, uh, but also now we have definitive, like, evidence that, because the frame story is the interrogation, that she is using the interrogation as, like, a cover-up, uh, you know, putting the, the blame on him to be Satchel, and, like, silencing him, and, like, tying up all the loose ends, uh, if the movie had ended there, I mo- it, there would have still been some questions, but it mostly would have been understandable. See, and even, like, okay, so here's the thing, is that we are making this sound very cut and dry, because I followed that perfectly. Like, there was, before we get into the final twists, let's, let's take, let's dissect this meat plot for a minute. Let's, let's take some, yeah, let's take stock. Because... Your description makes perfect sense, but you leave out the fact that James McAvoy's Percival was working with the Russians for some reason that's never really clearly explained. Um, The French girl obviously calls James McAvoy for some reason because she thinks he's Satchel because she has pictures of him as Satchel. Why did she call him if she was planning on giving those pictures to Charlize Theron's Lorraine because she has them labeled as Lorraine. Why is Percival working with the Russians? I'm just going to come back to that one because why is Percival working with the Russians? I'm so confused. Why is Percival working with the Russians? It's never explained. Why does he deem it necessary to kill French girl who's clearly inexperienced and doesn't feel I, so so many weird loose end motivations behind this very much so and i think uh this is this is kind of my idea and what i think the movie was trying to get at uh it, but maybe there might be a couple holes in what i'm saying but i think i think this is what they were trying to do so i think percival Percival is like a mad dog, like he's kind of a kind of a loose cannon. He's working, but he's working for the British. He sends, he's sending his plans on sending them the data, uh, but he keeps the contact with the Russians uh, as part of his own gambit to look like a double agent. Except like he's really not. He's still like he, like he's, he's gonna betray them. He's still loyal to the British. I think he's going to offer them a fake version of the list or like a or like because they do their business through like this watchmaker and these like watches so like he's gonna give him a watch that doesn't have the list in it and then he's gonna peace out and that's his plan uh so i think that's and i think he thought he could kill two birds with one stone by getting the russians make this shit make this false deal with the russians to get them to kill lorraine and kill uh, Spyglass, so Lorraine doesn't get Spyglass, and, like, you know, because he knows that she's a double agent because he's seen the list. Um, the only problem is that we, and this maybe would be more clear upon a second viewing, uh, the only problem is that I don't know if that timeline of when he gets the list versus, like, when he's talking to the Russians actually lines up. Yeah, especially because I feel like there's references to him having previous dealings with the Russians somewhere. I'm not entirely sure. The movie does kind of become a blur in a way, especially when we're trying to follow like three different plot lines to a conclusion and make sense of it all the while. Um, But it just... It's 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 odd. It's it's rough. It's hard to follow. Um, and actually, really quick before we jump into Lorraine's finale, which makes it all the fucking weirder. That's just the sweet cherry on top. Um, I did want to actually really quickly mention uh, 
James McAvoy Percival death because we get a blood squib on the camera. Which, oh, do we really? I didn't notice that. Yeah, it hits the camera, which is weirdly gratuitous. Or I, I, there is a blood squib that hits the camera at some point. I'm like ninety nine percent sure it's James McAvoy's death. But somewhere along the way, we get a blood squib on the camera, and it was the weirdest part of the movie, because it's it's like a hallmark of the ultra violent. Yeah, which yeah. I love the ultraviolet movies. I think they're a lot of fun. They're fucking brutal. But this is not an ultraviolet. But parts of it are. <laughs> okay. But not in the ultraviolet movie sense. Not not in like a Tarantino, like, fountains of blood. Like, yeah, not in that sense. It's another just weird part that doesn't fit with the rest of the movie. Even thematically... From a directorial standpoint, from a standpoint of how people die, it's it's so weird. It's I I think I know what it is. I think it is when uh, the Russians are beating the dude with the skateboard. Oh, because he oh. gets whacked in the head and blood hits the camera. I do remember that. Okay. That's what I'm thinking of. My point pretty much stands the entire time regardless because it was weird and it was an ultra violent trope, but it was not it didn't belong in this movie. Just replace Percival with beat up skate punk. And- I actually I actually did want to mention that scene because it was early enough that I thought maybe that the movie was going to shift into yeah. something more like that, but then it didn't. And then when it did get violent, it got, like, real. It got, like, brutal. So, yeah, that that is strange. And you're right. And the more the more you're talking about this, the more I'm kind of seeing a lot of these little moments, at, like, add up. And uh, this is a personal thing, is I saw a bunch of weird jump cuts. They were small, but they were there. Like, when a uh, French girl gets strangled, she, like, and this is... Pure nitpick, so I'm well aware of what I'm saying is pedantic and pointless, but, like, she gets strangled, and she's on the bed reaching for the gun, and that's where she dies. The next time we see her, she's on the ground, sprawled the other way, and, like, it it's not, like, a natural place for her to fall from where she was, which is, like, as I said, super pedantic. Super just nitpicky, but lays into my theory of it feels like there's multiple directors because that's a big oversight of just a dead body. Like, it's not like, ah, uh, if you look in this scene and from shift from 43B to 43C, the tissue box changes three degrees to the left. It's, yeah, it's like an actual, it's a person change. So I have a, I have a theory. I have a theory, um, and this is completely baseless, and I know that for bigger movies this is common. I know it's baked into the procedure and, like, all of Disney's stuff, uh, but this movie maybe had some reshoots. Like, maybe the production was troubled in some way, and they had to reshoot a good chunk of it. Uh, maybe something didn't play well with, like, a test audience, and they did some reshoots, Oh, this doesn't seem like the movie where they really give a fuck about a test audience, but it kind of feels that way sometimes. Yeah, like the, I mean, kind of the weird decisions that test audience would lean into why it feels like there's multiple directors to this because that test audience might have said this scene's too violent or something, and so they changed it. I mean, yeah, I guess I I don't know who the director of this is, but I guess uh, this David is a... Leitch, I think, is his name. Has he done any other like notable work? Uh, he did, oh, he did John Wick, V for Vendetta, The Mechanic, uh, so, like, he's not a stranger to any of this stuff. Very accomplished action director, actually. Um, yeah, huh, but still, so I guess, I guess, like, he would have enough clout in, but also be in a position where maybe he still had to answer to producers or test audiences that maybe wanted it cut a certain way just because like 
Charlize Theron's a big enough star. They wanted it to be more of like a vehicle for her. I could see that maybe there was some producer interference on this one. But uh, again, that's totally baseless. To uh, back up our references, he directed John Wick and he directed one of the Bourne movies. <laughs> so, oh, holy fuck. <laughs> I think we were a little bit more on the nose than we thought we were. Yeah, no, I mean, shit, very, like, this is... This guy's working in like a tradition. Like this is this is part of his like body of work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't realize that. Uh huh. Well, with that, let's let's jump into the wrap up of the movie now that we've derailed and had a whole director corner. Um, I you know that, that's good. I'm I'm glad I had that information no, now. It, it's good yeah. to have. Yeah. So, uh <laughs> we'll we'll go into the last bit of the movie and uh, as I mentioned, and since we're deep into spoiler territory now, like none of this conversation has made any sense if you hadn't seen the movie. I think the fact that we are deep into spoiler territory and the fact that people might not be able to follow this movie through our discussion is kind of leaning into how insane this plot is and how it's weirdly hard to follow what people are choosing to do. Um, I feel like most of our conversations, we've had a good reflection on what this might look like for someone who hasn't seen the movie and just wants to listen to it anyway because, you know, they're not going to go play Breath of the Wild or something like that. The fact that you might not have any idea what we're still talking about is absurd. Yeah, this is, I think, our first episode where we focused a lot more on just the plot as opposed to talking about like the themes and how death plays into those like we're we're really just trying to figure out the plot is what a big (laughs) chunk of this has been uh so you know hopefully that's illuminating for some people although to that end to add another piece of that puzzle you did remind me that this is something that might be an explanation a possible explanation if we're assuming that percival is working with the British, uh, and he's not, and the and the Russians thing, like he's using the Russians. If we're going by theory that he was using the Russians, then I think the reason he would want French girl taken out was that since she was an idiot who was going to expose him, uh, like she was just too much, too much of a liability, not really an ally not really his concern, and more of a danger than anything. So I think that would still fit with my theory. All right, um, yeah, I can, I can buy that. Yeah. So, but of course, like, that, it's more confusing because the scene plays it under the assumption that he is Satchel. And, and, and that's kind of what I think makes it murky. But what makes it even murkier is the actual ending, where we come back to the interrogation, uh, and... John Goodman's there, and that's great because I love John Goodman, but he's just kind of there the whole movie and doesn't really do much. Um, this is one of those actors, much like uh, Tom Hardy in Dunkirk. I'm just happy to see him. I'm I'm okay with it. <laughs> yeah. hey, you know, I'm, I'm I'm always I'm always glad to see John Goodman. Uh, so, uh, and he also shows up at some point during like the actual meat of the plot and like gives gives a. Uh, Lorraine a bit of a scolding. I don't and, know why he's there. Like, it could well, have been any U.S. agent. It's just it, him, him. I guess. I guess to emphasize the the next point is that you know now that we get we get what seemingly our confirmation after kind of the amb- ambiguity of Lorraine shooting Percival, we seem to get it more illuminated when we have a scene of her going and meeting with the Russians and giving them the list, like. Haha, job well done, except the Russians then, uh, all, they turn on her, and in fact, like, I actually found myself, like, raising an eyebrow, because the Russian guy offers her one glass, and doesn't take one for himself, and she just drinks from it, and I'm like, oh no, like, what are you doing? Yeah, like, you didn't I even was... try to, like, hide the, like, like stop, <laughs> I thought you, you were smarter than poisoned. this. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, and the movie's playing with that because then, like, he just tries to shoot her. Which I mean, I, why didn't he just poison her? She drank it. Uh, anyway, but then, lo- so Jesus Lorraine, Christ. so like, all right, but you can still kind of follow it. So, all right, she's Satchel, and he wants to tie up all the loose ends. Uh, like, you know, she's too much of a liability now. 
they have the list, she can go. So she kills them all and then is like... In a weird bout of ultraviolence, might I add you, because this is like 12 guys that she just guns down. Yeah, yeah. This is this is this is a lot more in that territory, and then she's just like you know, ha, you fools! Like you thought I was gonna give you the list? Like I never give you the real list. And then the last scene in the movie is her getting on a plane with John Goodman and revealing that she was an American agent the whole time. <laughs> like all I, I can think of, all I can think of this movie is that literally, like this movie could have ended with. Charlie's there turning to the camera, saying, just as planned, and then cutting to credits, because that's what it felt like. <laughs> so, with, with the revelation that she was working for the Americans, I have no idea why she did anything in this movie now. We can't, we're, we're coming up on time here, but I, th- just to, just to throw something else at you, why did she call, like, when John Goodman showed up, hand her to that paper, and she called the, the secret hotline, they said, Satchel has been eliminated? I forgot about that. And that was immediately after uh, James McAvoy's Russian contact was killed. I thought that was Satchel. I don't understand what is happening. I am, honest to God, so lost the more I think about this movie. I don't get it. So... I'm kind of, part of me kind of hopes that, like, someone in, like, a comment section somewhere can, can, is just listening to our conversation just shaking her head and going, like, you know, what fools, like, w- they couldn't follow this movie, but I, with my space brain... Tweet at us. Th- that, th- Tweet at us. Tell us. No, like, th- this is an instance where, like, you know, maybe I am a fool for not following all the intricacies of understanding the implications of what her being an American agent means. But, like, if you do, like, I want to know. Yeah, look, like, <laughs> I'm not going to say that we are the brightest people in the room by any means. Of course but we're not. we're not idiots. Like, we can follow a movie. But not this one. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, man. Who the... She, she, Satchel's been eliminated. I totally forgot about that. Oh, my God. All right. Look, we can go on about this for, like, another two hours and be nowhere closer to any sort of result. So, with that in mind... Wait, 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 wait. I have, okay. I have right, one... Right. <laughs> the only... <laughs> the only... Like, like, I'm trying to... I'm trying to think about... Oh, my I, God. I'm just sort of thinking about the fact that this is one of those movies where pretty much all of the main characters die. So, like, was that her goal? Was that, like, the CIA's goal to, like, take out all these, like, messy, like, crazy spies? Is that supposed to be the implication that, like, her plan all along was to... Was the list that important? Like, what is... I mean, it's an, I don't have, like, a clear explanation, but, like, it, it feels almost like, again, like, she could just turn to the camera and said, like, you know, all according to plan, and, and it would have, and it would have fit just as well, because it feels like the way that ending plays out, it's like, she put, got the upper hand on everyone in the end, but, like, I don't understand how, <laughs> or why. My dude... I have no goddamn clue whatsoever. Because if if the Americans are, if the Americans, the British are allies against the Soviets, so why would, if, if McAvoy isn't Satchel, why would she want Satchel dead? Why would she want him dead? I guess to prove that, because she is Satchel, but she, so she has to prove to the Russians and the British but then she's an American too, so it doesn't matter. And then the British are just down a bunch of agents, and the Russians are down a couple mooks, and that's it. Uh, I guess I guess the British are down only one agent, but it's like their dude, it's like their guy over there. Well, Either they down- wanted the wall to fall. That's established, because she says the line about like, "I've been feeding you misinformation, and you've been giving me bullets for my gun." 
to bring down the wall? Do we need to know more about the Cold War and the fall of the Berlin Wall to understand this movie? I don't I don't think that anything in the plot directly affected the fall of the wall. I think that was just sort of the background cuz I think the threat of the list getting out was that But she actually says that. That is a direct line. I think I think she meant that more metaphorically like to aid in the end of like the conflict because the threat of the list getting out is that the cold war is going to continue much longer uh so i don't think anything they actually did because they blend into the protests which are unrelated except seemingly not because they all raise their umbrellas on cue i think Uh, that was a setup from the dude she knows like there was a whole set that they were waiting for them to walk by yeah, yeah, yeah so like i give i'll give that defense yeah no no you're right uh so i think i think it was just more of a backdrop and that was just more like metaphorical like everything i've done has been in service of taking down the the soviets i suppose or keeping but like that's what i'm saying is like does that mean that what does the did the americas have a big uh hand in the fall of the iron curtain was there a big drive for that is that why they had her over there that doesn't explain the list side of things but it explains why she's sh- why she is satchel at least i don't i don't know i don't, look we we got we gotta stop man we <laughs> we gotta this can stop. only go oh, you're right this can only go on for so long and it will continue to go on Oh my god! All I'm, right, I'm, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna feel real stupid. I'm just gonna say like if I ever do watch this movie again, like with this background knowledge and everything makes perfect sense, like you know, because that <laughs> like 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 cause it, again, like you know, this is this is a recent movie. We I, I did I only saw it once, so uh, this may well be a case where after the twist, if you go back and buy with the twist in mind, it makes sense. But you know what? My gut says it really doesn't. Okay, and look. <laughs> The person I watched this movie with was a Russian scholar in college. She didn't have an answer for me as to, like, America. She would have had something to say about the American involvement in the fall of the Iron Curtain because she was all about the Cold War, let me tell you what. <laughs> I don't know. Look, I'm Sean McKinda. This has been Beating a Dead Horse. You can find me on Twitter at Sean underscore McKinda. And you can find me on Twitter at Jackson J. Keller. You can find the podcast on Twitter at B-A-D-H underscore cast. Uh, Please leave us a review on iTunes. Then go tell your friends. Tell somebody about us. We're trying to get our name out there right now. Word of mouth is super, super huge. Um, And while you're at it, go listen to Lords of the Highway. They did our theme song. It is Suicide Alternate Take off the album High Octane, Low Expectations. Next week, we'll be talking about Undertale. So if you have not played it yet, We highly recommend going and picking it up on Steam. It is 10 bucks. It's a shorter game, um, and it is pretty accessible to all skill levels. So, I mean, even if you're not generally into video games, I would really recommend picking it up. It's coming out on the PS4. Yeah, so even if you're not a PC gamer, you can still get involved. Get hyped. And hey. Don't shoot. I've I've got your shoe. Don't you go